once again, welcome to the future of production, discovering the five must-have apps you need on set. Talking about scriptation, crew glue, writer duet, shot lister, and shot deck. Very excited to have people from all over the world who are interested in learning about filmmaking. I'll introduce myself. Wow, I can't believe I didn't do that. I'm George Edelman, editor-in-chief at No Film School and host of the No Film School podcast. Uh, no Film School is a great resource, educational resource for filmmakers at all levels looking to discover more news, technology, and just all kinds of educational resources related to filmmaking. So check us out, nofilmschool.com. Subscribe to the podcast. Um, all right. I think we're going to get started here. Uh, I want to start by introducing Writer Duet and Guy Goldstein, the founder and CEO. Hello. Hey, Guy. You want to take us through the tool a little bit, introduce it to us, and then we'll, we'll run through a little screen share and, and show everybody how it works on a very high level. Yeah. So um, sharing my correct screen here. Uh, Writer Duet is known for real-time collaboration software. Uh, it's screenwriting software built for not only co-writing, but uh, working. Am I sharing my correct screen? I apologize. No. Yeah. OK. Oh, uh, <laughs> we got it skipped here. Good to um, me. <laughs> uh, working on the screenplays. And um, it's compatible with all standard screenwriting pro formats, like Final Draft, uh, other Fountain, PDFs, et cetera. And you can work and work with another writer in real time uh, from anywhere, in including web and mobile and desktop. Should I go through a quick run through the features as well? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what makes this a unique tool. Um, I'm familiar, but I think a lot of people might want to know more. Um, just yeah. about like, yeah, like start, start, start one and let's see, you know, let's see how it works. Let's get under the hood a little bit. Cool. So as all the basic features used to, if you've used any screenwriting software before, like you press tab and change to the line type, auto completes the character name who it expects to be talking, and you can type in another character name and auto complete all your other characters. Uh, some of the cool features are because it's cl completely cloud-based, um, you can access it from anywhere um, at any time on any device. Uh, you can log in on a friend's computer, you can log in from your phone and work with yourself in real time. Uh, you can also invite a writing partner in and have them co-writing. So I have another screen over here where they're going to type in uh, other fun stuff. Uh, and so basically in real time, you can see everything that's happening and it's also syncing offline on your device. So if you don't have internet for a while, you can keep writing. And as soon as you reconnect the internet, it's going to automatically sync everything for you. Uh, it has a uh, standard kind of like revision tracking. Um, it's kind of advanced version of that. I'll show you real quickly. You can turn on both production revisions and writer revisions. You can have them all at the same time, for example. So I could even say, I want to track, you know, my <laughs> friend, uh, your demo uh, with, you know, red text color and save that. And now all the writing that they do will automatically be revised for me. Um, and I can also turn on production revisions uh, and have those tracked as well. Um, and it's all again, compatible with any standard writing process that I've created a blue draft. I'll add the blue draft here. And then you can see all the blue text and they can all be exported and imported. Uh, some of the other cool features about it are it's outlining mode. So you can see and navigate just scene cards like anything else. Uh, one of the cool things is you can split your screen or view your cards in the full mode and kind of go back and forth between them. I could even split them off to show you how cool that looks. That is cool. Can you can you uh can you tell me real quick what auto populates into a card? It looks so like the default. Just, yeah. Yeah. Default is all your scenes. And then you have the sequence line type, which is essentially, uh, we call them uh, hidden lines because they don't export by default in a PDF. So you can have these like notes to yourself essentially while you're writing. Uh, so if you want to basically organize your thing in these sequence sections, you can collapse those and have like a new sequence, a fight scene. And then as you're like, you know, a little scene here of Jim new character gets mad and then have another scene about Jim. And so you can write directly in your outline as well. You can actually write your script here if you really wanted to. I can say, huh. Jim, uh, I'm mad. Um, and you can also just write outline lines to yourself. So outlines, again, so there's sequences and outline lines which don't appear in your script. This is where Jim runs away <laughs> and have these little notes to yourself all through the script. Uh, you can also obviously comment on lines and that happens both in the outliner and the uh, script itself, uh, notes. And these comments are again collaborative, so you can share with your friends and have other people writing notes to you. Uh, you can obviously do read only sharing as well as writer sharing. So you can say, hey, go review my script, and they can jump in and make their notes here. Uh, you can do a little collapse things to make it easier to see what you're focusing on across a 100 page script that makes it a lot easier. 
And you can even do like some cool reporting things. So I'll kind of show this. What I love is you can like work on your script based on um, character breakdowns of like what scenes they're in. Uh, only a dialogue you want to do a pass where I see like I only want to see Tony's dialogue in the script to make sure it sounds consistent and it's all mm. still editable when you're in this mode so I can continue writing stuff and it's in my main script is just a filtered down view of of the script and then when I go back to my full view everything is there so it lets you kind of focus on the pieces you want to work on uh, some other unique features of uh, it's got a lot of statistics and sort of analysis it can do with There's, your script yeah. yeah there is so much uh, there's so much here already, but I am kind of curious <laughs> about the analysis part. What 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 kind of data can it spit out to you that you need? Yeah, so one of the fun things is it automatically detects like uh, gender and stuff like that. I can tell that your camera is female based on like words oh, you wow. use about them or the name uh, as a fallback. Uh, and it can analyze your script by like how much they speak, each gender, each individual character. You can see how many lines they have. These are little acronyms that you can fit all the things. But like, are they using big words, small words? Like, what's the complexity based on like, you know, some reading scores that we put out there? Like, can break down your script by is it like really dense on the page? Like, 22% is very low density, meaning not a lot of black text. Like, if you look at it physically doesn't look very dark and that's a relaxing reading pace versus a really dense script is gonna be kind of intense slower reading pace so lots of little things we try to give you just to like understand your writing in different ways uh just to play around honestly and like feel like you're learning about your script without having to constantly reread the entire thing and actually on that note um you can also like listen to your script directly in here so we do the auto cast by uh gender um and even age a little bit and we can actually nice. listen to your script directly read by a full cast of computer voices uh if you want to hear it read by different different people and this passes uh it, it tells you if you pass the bechdel test which is pretty cool <laughs> I've never seen that in a writing screenwriting app before. That is unique. Yeah, it automatically detects that and does that based on the scenes that the characters are in, who's speaking to each other, et cetera. Um, if I awesome. Can, guy, guy, if I can just say my favorite feature of your app that I use Wanna, every day. Real quick, Zach, Zach the, Lepofsky, the, co founder of Shotlister here, <laughs> jumping in. <laughs> it also allows you to see for every line, you can see every version of that line that's ever existed. So as, as you're doing hundreds of revisions or working with other people, you can click on it and it'll show you all previous versions of what that line's been in the past, which is super helpful when you're making lots of changes. That yeah, is that's, awesome. That's, Cause you can look back and second it. guess your changes, <laughs> like go back and reverse. Like you can see everything you've ever done. Can it tell can me who's the, who's the, has the funniest line? It, it can, it can be who wrote <laughs> the best it. Joke. Uh, and you can even scroll back your script and literally go back in time to a previous version of it. It has an infinite history of everything you've been writing and working on. Wow. So you never have to worry about losing something. It has infinite backups in the cloud, but also you can back up to your own. You can set like a Google Drive and Dropbox backups and stuff to make sure you never have to think about backups and losing anything, which is such a horrible, horrible thought to even consider. And you don't have to keep coming up with new names for things like final, 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 dot, date, dot, <laughs> you know, whatever. That's, you know, that plagues has plagued writers for a long time. Um, I want to jump into our next, I want to introduce uh, Gad Tish, uh, founder and president of Crew Glue, so we can get on to the Crew Glue segment here. And we're going to keep you here, Guy, for the rest of time. Hello, how are you? Thank you. Hi, Gad. Hey, good to see you. I'm going to share away here. Okay, let's go here. This awkward part where we do all this fun, and then we do this. <laughs> Okay. All right. We see everything. Yeah, we're good. Yes. See okay, some Blade great. Runner. Great. Absolutely. And look where we got the picture from. You don't see all your video faces, right? Because sometimes I see that and then I don't know if people think, see it or not, right? We can see all your presentation stuff around the main slide, though. I think we can see your notes and stuff. Oh, that shouldn't happen. One second. Sorry. Let's see. I think you're muted, guy. Oh, you yeah. <laughs> can see how much better prepared you are than I was. <laughs> Everybody has their own style, right? Okay. There we go. Yeah. Now we're we good. Go. Okay, you don't see the. Ah, uh, yes. You do see it? Yeah. This. No, it, it all looks good via shot deck. We'll be talking about shot deck a little later. Now yeah, I see what so you were that. talking about. Yeah. There we go. All right. So we're good to go. Just the de the PowerPoint now. Yeah. Yes. All right, fantastic. Without further ado on this tech call. Uh, so <laughs> I am Gad Tish, founder uh, and president of Crewglue. Uh, Crewglue is a production management solution for film and television crew 
and we are honored to be here to discuss the future of production. We'd like to think filmmaking has come a long way since the 1880s, and in many ways it has. So why is it that when we create an on-screen image like this, behind the scenes, it still looks like this? Crew Glue is on a mission to connect crew with tools to simplify the production process. Crew Glue was built by crew, for crew, so we can automate repetitive production tasks so that data entered once is accessible from anywhere, like an AD text blasting production updates that relay to a wrap report, production report, and daily time reports, instead of having to start every report from scratch like they did in the 1880s. And working from a platform that connects, Kruglu is entrenched in all your workflows to connect those processes. We're relaying over 2 million emails a month going beyond send and submit, providing a connected experience, like distributing scripts with a deep link to scriptation and seamless integration to cloud repositories. Managing your production contacts based on category, like if they're a cast, minor, agent, vendor, to automate your requests based on those recipient types and files with live tracking of all your distribution, so that you have real-time status of those messages and a central hub for your production assets. Like scripts from Writer Duet, right? With comprehensive options for breakdowns to generate sides any way you need, or to relay those scripts into scriptation with that secure deep link we mentioned. We need one version of the truth, a single platform to keep production assets consistent and secure. Media creation workflows are cloud-based with every file from the first script to the camera captures, VFX assets, audio tracks, everything is stored in the cloud. So Krublu provides a modular platform to unify those workflows and with a flat rate for the whole production. We're not charging per account, so we don't make it cost prohibitive to everybody to work on our platform. It's free once you pay for that production account. Content creation is a collaborative experience. So why aren't production applications? And that's what Krublu is trying to do by providing a platform to connect to other applications and a central hub to get all of that stored. Production crew shouldn't have to share a login because this isn't Netflix. Hmm. Should be able to connect with their tools and their production from a central platform. And that is so critical now at this major inflection point for production. We are in the golden age of content. As we know, if you build sound stages today, they will come. In every market, demand has exceeded supply. Production crew are one of the fastest growing sectors of employment. And while there is a flood of crew that is new to production, the new crew are not new to tech, and tech is not new to production. We've seen tremendous advancements over the last decades, moving from film to digital, democratized content creation, and with it, an explosion of independent cinema. We can do anything now from anywhere with CGI and virtual production. And we have lots of tools available providing analytics on when to release produ productions what cast to use, and how to package content. The future of production is the crew. They are overdue for change. With so many tools available to advance production operations, the days of tribal knowledge, crappy pay, shitty hours, and having no life must end. We want to empower storytellers to tell more amazing stories while delivering at a speed and efficiency not possible today. We look forward to sharing more about our platform with you. Demos are available on demand and all packages are provided with free trials. So please get rolling to crewglue.com. Uh, Crewglue, as I'm saying, is connecting crew to what they do. So thank you very much. And that is Crewglue. Thank you, Gad. Yeah, you've, you've brought up a lot of stuff that I think we're definitely going to talk about in our roundtable. Um, but it is exciting just because oh, we lost him. He's still here somewhere. But it is, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> but it is exciting to hear people talking about like, let's drag 
the 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 process forward to where the rest of everything is. Um, let's bring in Scriptation CEO and founder Steve Vitolo. Hi, Steve. Hey, everyone. Hey. Gad, you can stick around. <laughs> Gad, can you can you fire up my uh, slideshow? Get that going. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't have that. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm Steve from Scriptation. Um, a little bit of my background. I uh, worked as a script coordinator on a bunch of TV shows for a number of years. Um, and I created Scriptation to solve the script revision process, which uh, Guy sort of taught, you know went through all the revisions and all the versions of jokes and everything like that. So what my experience was when I was working on a series, um, it, was actually, well, it was actually a pilot, and every single night we were put out a full 50-page script, and everyone would take notes on that script, and then they would get the new script, and then they'd have to recopy all their notes and dump the old script. So uh, I was wondering if there was a way we could do that digitally, but also transfer the notes across script revisions, and that's uh, how Scriptation was born. So I'll run through a little demo of how that's going to work, hopefully, if my AirPlay works. All right, we screen can watch sharing your Apple TV. successful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone can see the screen? Yep. OK, great. Um, so this is Scriptation. Um, it's a place where you could annotate PDF scripts and, and do a lot more with them. And I'll, I'll walk you through that. So first, I, we, as Gad mentioned, we have an integration with CrewBlue. Um, so I'm going to show you a script that was uh, sent out in CrewBlue that we're going to annotate in Scriptation. So I'll go to my connection here. And we can see everything in CrewBlue that's populated. I'm going to go into the scripts folder, say episode 101. And I'm going to open my script, which has been watermarked in CrewBlue. That's me. Um, so this is a sample script for scriptation. Um, I'm going to show you just some annotations here, what you can do. So on top, you have the annotation bar, which is if anyone has used Adobe or any other PDF annotator, you can make notes on there. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of the type of notes you can make. You guys probably know that. Um, but I'll show you some things you can do in Scriptation that you can't do in any typical annotation software. So one of the things that we have are layers. And this is a chance for you to either use them for yourself or collaborate with your team where you can have production notes that you make. So you can go around to different meetings. You could have tone meeting notes and you could turn them on and off in the background. So if you want to view all of your notes at once, you can do that. If you only want to view one layer at a time, so let's see, I'll just go back to the tone meeting notes. You can do that. And so I'll just, I'll jump back up to the directing notes. So Scriptation lets you create any sort of notes that you want. You can add pages to, you can add any sort of facing pages that you want. Sorry, I've got the mouse here and I'm still using my finger, but you can add facing pages. So this is a facing page and then you can move them around on the script however you want, like that. Let's save. And then the real magic of scriptation and sort of the reason to be for the app is the ability to transfer notes into the new version of the script. So I'll go into the updated draft. I'll go into the shooting draft here. So it's a, it's a blank script and this happens a lot. You can get a draft where you go from the table draft to the shooting draft and pages aren't locked and you have to rewrite all of your notes. So with Scriptation, you can go up here, hit the transfer button. Let's go to the initial draft. And I'm gonna get some options here. So for now, we're not gonna collate pages because it's a full draft. We're not gonna compare scripts for now. You can see that on, uh, on our website, but we will transfer some of the bookmarks. So I'm gonna take all of the layers and all the notes that I spent all this time creating. I'll hit begin. And I've transferred all of my notes into the new draft. And again, these pages aren't locked. So you're not tied to 
scene numbers or where it is on the page. So you get all of your notes here. You can toggle them all on. You could change the layers and all of your notes get moved over. And just a few other quick things you could do in scriptation before I will let everyone else talk. Um, there's an actor highlight function where you could go through the script and automatically highlight lines. And that works in conjunction with reader mode, which is if you've ever had tried to read a script on your iPad, it's not great. I'm sorry, on your iPhone, it's not great. So with reader mode, you can actually get a version of the script that actually looks like a script and is readable. And for table reads, you could even scroll through this mode mm -hmm. and adjust it. So it's really helpful, especially if you're on a show, which I was, where you have actors that get to the table read and then are highlighting their lines on their paper script and they're ready to go and then they miss some lines or they, you know, they're trying to eat while they're saying some of the jokes and that don't work quite well. So this, you know, with the actor highlight automates all of that. And that's it. Very cool. Um... Let's jump over to Shotlister with Zach Lepofsky, the co-founder of Shotlister. All right. Well, first, I want to spend a moment to to actually sell Steve a little bit better here, which is that <laughs> please do it. It actually like you made it look so simple there, but I can attest that it's actually black magic what happens in that app. Like <laughs> you just he clicked a few buttons and the notes went over and it looked the same, but having done that process many times on shows where I've gotten revisions and you're like, there's no way this is going to work. There's no way. There's no way it's going to know that this is now over here and this is here and that part of the text got moved here and all these stickers I put here and you click a button and it all just like, it all magically happens. So it's, it's, it's every time I'm like, this time it's not going to work. I know it. And it, every time it does work. So You haven't uh, broken it yet is what you're yeah. saying. So that's a challenge you're putting out it's, there. It's it's black. It's the closest thing to black magic on your iPad. Um, you can put that on your site, Steve. The um, and yeah, and I was telling everyone else I could probably demo everybody's software. I don't I don't I don't use Crew Glue yet, but Writer Duet I use every day. Shot Deck is responsible for every job I've ever gotten in the last you know two years. Uh, and Writers Duet uh, and and Scriptation, you know, I use them all the time. Shotlister is an app that I created, sort of similarly to Steve, to solve a problem. Uh, I was, you know, had a shot list on the printed out on a piece of paper on the back of my AD, trying to do math in the margin to see how much time we had left in the rest of the day, how many shots we'd, we'd be able to get, and just figured there's got to be a better way of doing this. This can't be the state of the art of shot listing in the world. Um, and that was a long time ago. That was maybe 13, 14 years ago. I can't remember. It was around the time the iPad came out. Um, and we built this app called Shotlister, which is both the, let me see if I can figure out the sharing here, but Shotlister is basically not only the best way to make a shot list and create a shot list, uh, but also the best way to make a shooting schedule on a shot by shot and minute by minute level, which is really where it becomes um, super powerful. Let's see if this works. The suspense. Oh. All right, <laughs> you like something. And yeah, there we go. All right, so um, Shotlister is available on Mac OS and iOS and Android, but I'm just showing it to you here on, on uh, iOS. So just to give you a very high level look at it, this is where you see your projects. I have a Indiana Jones sort of demo project here that I can show. Um, and so each project, very much like the rest of your work has sort of scenes and inside of scenes, there's shots. We also do support um, episodes. You can see there on the left, some of the settings for projects. So you can have multiple episodes uh, that you're shot listing at the same time. So you can block shoot them during your shoot day. You can use 24 hour time. You can exclude I and O from your shot numbers, uh, which some people do. There's sort of things like that. You can also sync the project with your crew. Um, and then you've got your list of scenes here. Um, you can color them. Uh, you know, basically that's pretty simple. And when inside of, sorry, I live next to the fire station. So there's always a fire truck going by. 
uh, not good for <laughs> for life on Zoom. Um, but basically inside of a scene, there's always gonna be a bunch of shots. Um, you can customize all of the data here is that you wanna track for each of your shots. So these are all the different sort of categories that we have. You can even create your own categories uh, and add them at the bottom. You can uh, resort you know, the order of where, how you want your categories to be shown um, or turn different categories on or off. This is an example of, um, I just turned on two of our numbering categories. Uh, prep number is, and shot number, it's just to quickly explain that. One is the order in which the shots are being shot, which is alphanumeric, mm. and the other is a numerical, which is which doesn't change. So that sometimes there's things like visual effects breakdowns or, um, or storyboards that you want a numbering system that doesn't change from prep to post. Uh, and so the prep number is numerical based on the order of the shots in scene mode and shot number is based on the order of the shots as they're shot. Um, so it's sort of like your slate, right? Yeah. It's a little, it's like your slate is coming into play within the app. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you can see there sort of all the different information on the left that scenes have, basic stuff. Um, we also support um, uh, with Shotlister Pro, which is an additional subscription we have. There's some extra things you can do, for example, having storyboards. Um, which you can see here, sort of, uh, you can see all your storyboards and uh, next to all your shots. Um, and so, you know, what the first part of the app is, is basically the ability to just list all the shots in the best way of any app that is, that's being built, is specifically built for that, way better than doing it in Excel or anything else. You can see all the different types of, um, you know, you can track which camera's doing what, which setup it is, what gear you're gonna need, all that type of stuff. But the real secret to Shotlister that kind of makes it a game changer is the other mode, which is at the bottom of the screen there, shoot day mode. So um, probably most filmmakers have, have listed their shots, but building a shooting schedule on a shot by shot level is really where things um, uh, get really, really helpful. So when you're in prep, you can uh, build a shooting schedule um, on a shot by shot level. So you put in the information of your shoot day, you kind of put in your call time, your wrap time. Uh, it, it, um, then, then on the right here, you can see that each of these shots basically have a little amount of time. And you kind of estimate how long you think each one's going to take. And the more you do this, the better you get at doing it. And in prep, you quickly kind of, you can see there on the left, um, it's telling me we have a 12 hour shoot day and I have 12 hours and 38 minutes of, <laughs> of shots. Usually when you first build a shoot day, it says 14 hours and you're like, oh boy, how am I gonna fit this 14 hours of, of shots into these 12 hours? So it's a really good prep planning tool of like, okay, maybe I'll combine a few shots. Um, you know, I'll move them, I'll, I'll get rid of them. Maybe this one doesn't need an hour. Maybe we can do that in half an hour. Um, you can also, we have a strip board mode, which allows you to see, um, just the scene headers, not the shots. And then you can globally change the amount of time for that whole scene. And it'll proportionally change the amount of time that you're setting for each shot. Um, and basically that allows you to theoretically get to a point where you have a shoot day that's gonna fit at least your estimates within the time that you have. Um, here, let me reduce this by a little bit more. You'll see that there, I believe. Um, so there, theoretically, we're under 12 hours. Um, and then when you're actually shooting, so here's a day um, that'll show you uh, what it looks like when you're actually shooting. Um, it goes into what's called live mode. Um, and what live mode does is it basically knows what time it is. It knows how much you've finished and how much you have left to do based on your estimates and gives and tells you how you're doing. So right now, we're an hour behind, <laughs> um, which you can see at the top. So basically, uh, if I complete the shot that we're on right now, um, it will uh, recalculate. And you see there's sort of two numbers there at the top. One is, one says shot plus 14, the other one says wrap 59. Um, wrap 59 basically means right now you're, you're an hour over wrap. Shot 14 means if you finished this shot right now, you'd be 14 minutes over. So it kind of gives mm. you basically an estimate of if you finish right now, where you would be, because um, you can't really see it right now, but um, the sort of red bar on the left there is is kind of, it's gonna slowly descend down through that shot, giving you sort of an idea of how much time uh, you were going. And so if you're behind, 
it's not just panic mode. You go, okay, we're an hour behind. What am I going to do? Okay, well, uh, I, I think we need less for this. Maybe um, these shots I'm going to move to another day. So I'm going to delete those. Um, or you can uh, just get rid of stuff entirely. Um, and so I'm just going to remove that from the shoot day. Um, and so now if we finish this shot, we'd be fully on time. The other thing you can do is combine shots. Um, so for example, there's some shots here you can see that our camera A and camera B are shooting together. If for example, I thought I could do camera C at the same time, I could go in here and say link with next. And basically that tells the app that we're going to be shooting both of these shots uh, together and theoretically saving time by doing so. Um, and so now you can see that that removed that hour amount of work off, off the schedule. So now we're actually an hour ahead. Um, and the app glows green. So as you're uh, using Shotlister on sets, there's definitely this, uh, people get to know, are we, are we in the green or are we in the red? Um, but really what it is is a tool to visualize how you're doing. Um, you know, all the filmmakers and directors that uh, I hear from from all around the world um, basically tell me they didn't know how they did it before, basically, because as a director myself, I know how it is and where you're sort of, how much there's left to fit in the rest of the day is sort of this hard thing to imagine and sort of the scary thing to imagine. Whereas having something that's a tool that visualizes that for you, that you can change on the fly rather than scribbling a little bit of piece of paper, allows you to really have the confidence to get the stuff that matters most earlier in the day. So you're not racing against the clock at the end of the day. It also is a really great tool for communicating the plan. Um, not only to the crew, but to the producers, which can really help them get off your neck about what the hell is going on? Are we gonna, <laughs> what, do you know what you're doing? And you can say, look, I know what I'm doing. Then we're gonna do this, 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 and this, and then this, and it's gonna fit in the time that we have. So, um, and it's a great tool for working with your, with your DP and your AD, or sometimes it's the AD or DP that uses the app if the director's not as, uh, doesn't use it as much. And um, it can also export all sorts of different it can export um, CSVs to use into other stuff, software, it can export PDFs to distribute with the crew. Um, and yeah, the last thing I'll say is we have, um, it's free on iOS. It uh, costs 40 bucks on Mac OS. Um, there's a subscription called Shotlister Pro for a bunch of the um, high-end features, but the, the free iOS version is basically 90% of the app. Um, and if anybody wants Shotlister Pro for free for a year, you can just email us at Sharon at shotlister.com and she'll send you a code for free Shotlister Pro. So I'll put Very that cool. in the chat. Um, yeah, there's a lot to talk about there. It, I think the, the fact that you can adjust your plan on the fly is a game changer. Um, yeah. And know that well, you have the confidence to you do that without scribbling. You always are anyway, but yeah. instead you're yeah. like doing it with pen and paper and Excel yeah. sheets and it's a total nightmare. Um, so um, basically it's, it's life, life yeah. changing. Let's uh, let's jump over to Shot Deck with Lawrence Scher. Uh There he is. What's up, everyone? Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, all this stuff is incredible. Amazing tools. Uh, really happy to be here, and thank you for that. As as others spoke to, you know, I was trying to solve a problem similarly. I'm a DP and a sometimes director, not as good director. I don't know. All, <laughs> Okay, DP, I've shot movies like the Hangover series and Joker and stuff like that. And invariably throughout my process, and this went all the way back to like my early pitches, trying to get movies like Garden State, I would always be in need for reference material. And the reference material I was looking for were screenshots from movies to to like express my vision, to put it in a pitch deck. But not just for decks and not just for pitching, but once I got the job, then a whole new process of needing research and reference material was needed. And so I would go and buy used DVDs and I would grab screen grabs and put them in folders. And years after years of building these disparate folders across landscapes of, of hard drives and trying to find them, I was like, <laughs> God, I wish they were all keyworded in such a multitude of ways that I could find these all in a flash and be and have and have a real organization to them. I asked my dad who was retired, could you do it on Lightroom and just create a bunch of keywords? He said no. And so then I started building Shot Deck. 
uh, almost eight years, nine years ago, kept it in beta really small for a little while and then launched it officially as like a, you know, a more public site, uh, May of last year. So we're almost at a year of like an actual official launch. It was in beta before that. Anyway, the essence of it is it's a tool for research and reference and inspiration. And it's just a massive database of images from movies and television. So pretty straightforward. This is the front page. You can search right from there. There's some like little trending and, you know, other things like here where you can just get inspired and see stuff there. But you could also just start and browse shots. And you'll see here just you can just sort of this is what I usually do sometimes. I'll just start here and just start looking for shots that intrigue me. But let's just say I always used to say, like, if I was doing a movie and I start looking at the script and I look at the scenes that we're going to be doing and I say, oh, I'm doing a prison movie. Certainly, I could go on Google and some other sites and find Shawshank Redemption. But what the hope was with Shot Deck and what, what we tried to do in building it was I could search for prison and now not just find the images from, you know, here we have 280 titles from movies that have prison shots and you can stack them over here on this little view section and now see them stacked in the sort of name of the title of the movie. Uh, it's just a little slow here. But uh, and you can find the image here. You can look at different views. You know, there's like a quad split view. There's a single single view, a sort of slideshow view as well. But in here is not only would you discover you get those shots from Shawshank, of course, but you'd also get movies that you've never even heard of. So the hope was that it would be a place for inspiration as well and discovery of new titles. So if you open up any of the shots, you'll see a multitude of of tags you know you'll see genre director crew information the shot time in the movie the time period color information framing lensing lens you know the cameras that were used lenses that were used filming and story location set all these things you can see all the shots from that movie and so you basically you know start breaking down your movie and breaking down your pitch deck for what you're trying to look for and then you can start building decks. So let's say I'm going to go, oh, well, let me build a new deck right here. There's a little hamburger that can, you know, create a new deck here. I'll do prison, right? Uh, and I'll just start populating that deck, right? So I'll put this in here, you know, and I'll start just basically. Now, that last deck I just added becomes a quick add here. And I can just now start floating through and finding images that just catch my fancy to make it really quick. You know, and then I can go up to here where there are decks and now I can see all my decks, including prison. And I can move them around. I can move the images around. I can add a little note here. Love this. Right. And then do that. And then within here, I can now share it with people. I could share it with my crew. I could share it with my director. They can add notes. I can export the entire deck to and this will become better over time but right now you can export the entire folder of images as full res shots that'll just go on your desktop so if you're building let's say a pitch deck or in another form like indesign or or whatever you might use you know google you know pages or sheets or whatever you might use for the way you build decks you can export it in a full res uh folder there or you can export it as a pdf you can move your shots around. You can add shots into another deck and make a sub deck out of it. So you can go into here and now suddenly there's a sub deck right here. You can add multiple decks. So like for instance, Romeo was the working title of Joker when we made it. And what I basically do when I start any project, whether it's a commercial or a music video or a television you know, pilot or, or a movie, is I break down the scripts using some of the software you guys have here. I sort of find the, uh, you know, the, the sets that I'm sort of interested in finding inspirational shots for reference shots. And then, and then I start basically building folders of those things. So like I'm looking for inspiration for bus imagery, let's say for Joker, and I might just pull a shot. Now that shot might have some reference. It might just be a leaping off point for my, uh, you know, for, for me to have conversations with the director but I, about. I definitely remember the shots that inspired. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, the movie, like, so stuff, nice work. See, like, you'll see one image of, you know, uh, you know, I'll try to find something more specifically, you know, like hospital imagery, right? Like so very similar, you know, exterior of shots. This is from actually uh, from Good Time, 
And then if you go and look at, you know, if we go back and look at Joker and we look at the hospital stuff from Joker, you know, the exterior of the hospital, you know, I'm going to prove if I've, you know, with, with all the, in, all, with all of my movies, I'm responsible for tagging them myself, incredibly <laughs> enough. So if it's not in here, it means that I just didn't tag it. Oh, good. I, at least I tagged it. But you can see an image like this and the color palette, not too dissimilar than Good Time. Not to say I just straight up ripped it off, but I've always been intrigued by that sort of mix of color light and, and cyans and oranges, sodium vapor and uncorrected fluorescence. And so it may just sit there as a leaping off point for me to have conversations with the director. It may sit there for me to talk with my gaffer and from the rest of my crew. It may just sit there to just start the conversation in my brain so that I can start thinking about the movie and dreaming about the movie. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We have a blog here in which we have some, you know, we have, we basically release two, two titles a, a day on average. So 15 titles a week. Uh, last year we did a movie, uh, since our launch, we did a movie a day this year. We're going to try to do two movies a day, maybe even get to a thousand, thousand movies for the year. Obviously if I could push a button, I'd have, a billion shots in every single thing <laughs> represented commercials music videos tv uh movies so that it becomes like the effectively the sort of paper of record for information for for movies and television and any of the moving images so that you can go here and have this kind of deep dive of information for you to not just see amazing imagery to get you inspired but to also learn and be educated and all those things we do I love how you can you can yeah. search by so many different things, even down there on the trending things. There's so many ways you can search for inspiration. That's right. And you can filter by all these sort of, so all these things are filterable, right? So you can search by three perf movies. You can search by movies that are cross processed or, you know, time of day and look for a bunch of images of just sunset. You know, you can look at, uh, by the number of people in the shot, gender, we don't have a Bechtel thing, but I would love for that to be a part. That really got me interested. That 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 thing that you can actually see if a movie tests, the, you know, if it passes a Bechtel test is a really interesting thing. But so all of these things are filterable. But you also can look, you know, for year two thousand and see like what we have released in the year two thousand. So all the movies at sunset, you know, for two thousand, or just all the movies that we have from the release year two thousand. Thirty titles there or you know the entire decade those kind of things we can search by we've just added colorists so you now can search by colorist um yeah so it's a basically oh. the hope and the desire is not just that it's it's a place in which you can find the specific thing you're looking for but that you know more importantly you can find something you've never heard of discover new talent discover new crew i've always said more than even like my lawrence sure website you know lawrenceshore.com I actually think if I was going to send somebody to look at my work I'd rather they go to shot deck because in a way this is more representative of my my body of work the images if I was going into a meeting and talking about somebody I'd rather them than having an inert which became the sort of paper of record when you'd walk into a room it wasn't even a resume that your agency would send it was now they would just print out the IMDb well, this would be a better version by IMDb because at least now we could have conversations about the shots. We could talk about this shot, talk about how we did it, all these kind of things. Um, yeah. And then, you know, future version, which I'll just show you because we have it here, is we'll start to do motion. So you would hit this mm -hmm. and you would just instantly play a, ver you know, a section of the movie that would show it in context. So to come. There you go. Very cool. I hope I did um, all of it. I don't usually do these things, and these guys had like PowerPoints. I was very impressed. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, but but you did I, fine. But, but I hope uh, I hope you get the gist of it. Everybody, thank you guys so much for going through. Um, I know we kind of abridged it a little bit. I want to open up now to just talking about all of these tools and the future in general. I I, I want to start with and eventually get to some questions from our from our audience that keeps growing, honestly. But um, one thing a few of you mentioned and that I always think about whenever I'm looking at these tools is that this industry is 
slow to adapt um and it doesn't like change i mean a lot of industries don't but this particular industry will be like no i'd rather you keep writing it on a yellow legal pad and i'd rather like printing out an imdb just that in of itself is funny it's like why would you waste paper to print it out but they'll do that um so i think the question really to just start is like you know obviously you guys are at the forefront of pushing us forward by saying like here's a solution but how do we help as a community or as as creators as founders of tools how do we help the industry adapt to this stuff and actually use it and actually get people like excited about integrating these different things together and and seeing it on set and not just being like no we're using this because i use it but like having it show up and have it already be there instead of you know yeah, somebody says right. by convincing them how much time they will save yes <laughs> that's the goal but they don't believe you or they don't because to them a new thing is scary and they don't learning is is a no so yeah. let's talk about that i have sort of Two, two thoughts on that. One is when was when we were starting with Shotlister, it was like literally when the iPad had just come out and people, the idea of using it to create or to work was almost, it was just, isn't that just for reading stuff basically, or a big thing to take photos with. And I did talks to the DGA and stuff and everyone was like, just like, what's an iPad basically? And there was a huge <laughs> amount of resistance and, and like, why would I ever use the iPad for work or to create? That's just a thing to play games or to read. Um, and so in the last 13, 14 years, there's been a dramatic shift in just people. And some of it's been certain age, certain age aging out, <laughs> a new age coming in. But what I've done on my shows for all the new tech, like I was one of the first people pushing Slack on, on our film crews, uh, maybe like seven years ago, five, six, seven years ago. And and there was a lot of hesitancy because you know they don't know why they would uh, why Slack would be better than just using email. And what we started to do, uh, which is one one way of answering the question, is um, there was a bunch of it was like Shotlister, Scriptation, you know, Slack. I would basically Monday morning nine a.m. every week in prep. Whoever just started that week, their first meeting would be basically a, a tech tutorial meeting where basically as they finished writing their paperwork to their start paperwork, they would come into a room with me and I would just show them how Slack works, show them how whatever apps we're using work in a like ask questions. It's okay to not know how this is going and did it every Monday morning. So they could even come back the next Monday morning if they still didn't feel certain about it. And there was always new people coming in um, and doing that all the way through prep doesn't necessarily get everyone who's gonna be there during production but it does go a long way. Cause I started seeing uh, the gaffer who was, you know, in his sixties showing his best boy, how cool Slack was when I was on set and they didn't know I was standing there, you know? And so um, it can trickle down through to production. That was one way of just on a ground level of your crew, how to do it is just do a, a Monday morning tech tutorial meeting. Something else, and I think this is on the app makers too, is fitting it in the process rather than saying you have to change your process because of this. Uh, I'll use mm. Scriptation as an example that does it really well. You get a PDF. No one's asking you how did you open your PDF and make awesome notes until <laughs> you do it and they want to steal your cool tricks. Uh, but our mm. new app being compatible with Final Draft. You can import your Final Draft, right? Export your Final Draft. No one cares. They're all getting an FDX file in the end. And I think a lot of these apps, I think all these apps do that, where an individual can take advantage of them, get something powerful, make their life better, and then just pretend they just are a genius who saved 12 hours of their life and everyone else is impressed by them. Uh, you know, I, I think from the like founder perspective, and, you know, we've all probably made 4,000 mistakes in this, but one of the, you know, the biggest mistake I made was trying to go to the top and trying to sell scriptation, let's say on the, on the studio side. And I would say, well, here's the advantage for everyone on the crew. And a lot of those executives had never worked on a show or any, you know, they didn't really know what was going on in production. So I'm trying to, trying to explain the problem of a script revision process. And if you have to explain the problem, they're not gonna buy the solution. So I, I, I think, you know, for a lot of us, we just have to, you know, we understand the, the, the issues. And we have to build the better mousetrap. And if it gets in people's hands, and I, I think, you know, as far as, you know, scriptation and, you know, shot lister, we're just putting it 
on the iPad, on the iPhone, and we're getting it out there. And it's something, you know, with a lot of these apps, it's, you know, for scriptation, it's very demonstrable. You have one person on set that's using this thing and it's saving them time. And then there's a script revision that comes and someone that's using scriptation is ready to go. And someone that's not is fumbling through paper. Um, that's sort of slowly, you know, you have to do it from the bottom up and from the ground level. And then if, if what you, you know, build in your app and your software is good, then it's going to get adoption because it's very stressful. <laughs> this job is very stressful. There are only so many hours in a day and you're going to want to find the best tool that is working for you and for everybody else. Yeah. I think the using it, the people who have the problem using it and solving the problem and then it becomes contagious because they've seen that instead of trying to introduce it as like, hey, here's this thing that we have to use. I like that take. Um, does anyone else have thoughts? Because the other thing is like change is scary, right? How do you make it not scary too? Larry, you had something? No, I was saying I think all of us have probably experienced that the number one thing that sort of sells the, the tool is word of mouth, right? So like the first person like Jendra in the comments mentioned, she had sort of pointed me out to scriptation a while ago and and it's like that process of transferring notes is something i didn't even know was solvable right it was like but i i suffered through it for decades right and so it's like it's just a matter i, I agree also that if you go to the top they're the least likely to change because they're super ingrained in their in their ways and now warner brothers is being run by you know some reality <laughs> show. Like, discovery like, or something awesome. what was that today yeah right. but, then, it's but, like, but it's like point... so they're not going to change right they're like they've never they're artist people to sort of like you know and i was imagining with something like crew glue because i feel like what you're trying to solve in your in your thing which is incredible there are sort of things that have happened maybe in the last four years whether it's like you know the 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 big studios trying to get people all to sort of coordinate in ways but it's like they're still not the greatest pieces of technology and so there's there's still not sort of being built in a way that really solves the problem but they're at least starting to adapt some of those things which i assume is are some of your competitors for Krulu or something but but i think your service does it in a way that's i think a little bit more exciting than box or you know picks or you know. they don't know the problem also because they haven't lived with it in a lot of situations so you're providing the solution to the people who have the problem is is a much better idea then even though they're not necessarily writing the checks, they may be the ones who come in and they're just like, now That's I right. use this thing because it's faster. And nobody well, above is going to be like, yeah. you know. You look at Frame.io, which was competing against big, big companies. And I think they solved some problems better than than some of those companies that, that were sort of ahead of the game on them. And maybe just because they were a little bit more on the streets. But I do believe you got to be in the trenches. It's like, the people that build it because it was a problem they were having are always going to build, I think, a better tool. As well, plus, to like, an idea that somebody told them was a problem, right? Because you're going to the really vast, understand it. I'm sure it's the same for most of you guys, but the vast majority of our users come from people just hitting Google and going, how do I solve this problem? <laughs> so, like, people don't necessarily know that, that these apps exist, but they know that an app must exist to solve this problem. And so they search for it and then end up, you know, finding it. And then, yeah, word of mouth of basically I, people that have solved that problem. I'm probably responsible for 10% of the shot tech users myself telling, <laughs> telling, telling people about it every day. The, uh, you know, and, and that's why we've been very, uh, we've always found too, like in every opportunity we give the app away because it always leads to way more sales because just having people use it leads to people being excited to tell other people about it. There, uh, there's a great point in the comments from Ken. Uh, some of the issue is generational. Uh, a lot of it is based on the time pressure of learning something new, which I, I think that there is, it's an industry where there is a lot of pressure to succeed and not make any mistakes. And uh, there was a, a mention earlier too of like, it's okay to come into that early morning sprint on Mondays where you talk about all the tech, not tech we're using and, and ask questions and not know. Because I think being creating a sense, a safe space of like, hey, there's a couple things we're using here you might not know about. Nobody's going to get mad at you or, or lecture you if you screw up with it initially. Like then there's maybe a little bit less of that. Uh, well, I've always done it this way and I don't want to get my head chopped off because, you know, I forgot to use the strip board. 
because I only ever use the strip board because there is a lot. It's the trenches can be very like life or death, you know, <laughs> fair or not. But yeah. I think it's incumbent on the apps also, like you said, the second nature thing. I think they have to be second nature instantly where something is better the moment you use it. So no one's going to regret that first like, OK, I went to the you know app or site or whatever and I did something and my life was suddenly better. Okay, well, I saved, you know, something. Now maybe I'll invest a little bit of time to see what else in my life could get better because of that. And I think having those like instant wins is important for the audience. They, they, you need to come there for a purpose that you achieve immediately. And I want to point out that each of you went through and, and got in pretty deep on a lot of your tools. But at the very surface level, I can speak from experience. There are things you can gain out of them immediately without going to any of these advanced functions. The advanced functions are kind of exciting. But there's some stuff that happens instantly that is better than the alternatives. And that's kind of why, like, those, those deeper things are, make, make them stickier long term. But I think that uh, just to try out and find out exactly that it's like, if it's just, oh, I can write with my writing partner at the same time. Or, oh, I can find every shot uh, that I want that looks like a hospital and then decide which one I want to use to pitch my, my look or I can just like sign everybody up in my crew and not have, you know, 10 files, folders, like and it'd just be like central localized, like organizationally as an AD or production manager, that's huge. So I think there's quick things to gain. Um, what are some problems you guys see that you still want to see solved that you haven't seen solved yet? I think one that comes to my mind and it's things like this is like, sort of there's lots of people like us creating lots of cool things it's very difficult to get them all to talk to each other um you know different file formats and different sharing platforms and different cloud systems you know i think one of the biggest requests we always get is about can you connect to this and that and can, can this connect to this but then if that person changes their app it breaks the connection you know so getting mm. i think one of the biggest you know um and steve and guy everyone's been good at we are sort of a community of, of apps, but it's one of the biggest challenges, not just from a technological perspective, but just from an organizational perspective of getting getting all the different platforms, because there's so many different ones and some of them compete and none of us really compete, but some of them do compete. Um, and you know, from a user perspective, you almost want that Apple-like experience of you've got 20 apps and they all perfectly talk to each other. Um, and, you know, some of that works, you know, with having Final Draft as a file format that we can all open as sort of, but again, that's a proprietary format that they can change at any time. So like the, the nature of that is one of the challenges for sure. It's a really good point. I love that you guys have, you're a, a Justice League or an Avengers or whatever of like the, we want to put this together so people don't have to figure out they can use only this isolated thing. It doesn't talk. It's not friendly with those other tools, like more tools that take you from A to Z workflow wise. It's a, that makes it so much easier to adopt. And I think, you know, everyone here is an expertise in their particular thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, Guy is that, you know, Writer Duet is a piece of writing software and doing that really, really well. And I think that's really the advantage of, you know, get it staying in your lane, doing your thing really well, and then talking to each other. Because I think, you know, an issue at the studios is they have some of these bigger companies where they create these, these products that one, they don't have to be good because the studio's already using it and they have big contracts. Um, and then they try and do everything for everyone. And mm -hmm. I think for us, and this is, this is the way it works, you know, everyone's going to find their own product and it's like, okay, this does, this app does that thing really well. And I think what we would all like, and, you know, is, is a challenge. And I think we've all sort of, you know, a lot of us have spoken to each other about how we can work and it's hard. Um, but I think for the, for the users, obviously, like we would all love for the apps to be talking to each other. And, and just, and not in a way that we're dictating what needs to be done for the user, but a way that a user can say, oh, well, this is something that's going to help me and it's going to save me some time if I can integrate this app with another app. And that's, I mean, that's the promise of Kruglu. I mean, we've already done that with Movie Magic and Scriptation and lots of other cloud repositories and TripGrid 
and we're continuing to add more integration partners. I mean, from my experiences on sets, as much as we started getting uh, laptops were becoming more predominant and uh, technology was evolving the hardware, at the same time as we see even with COVID, now everybody's digitized, but that's aggravated a problem. And we do have more paper now and more data reconciliation and wrangling that we have to do. So there should be ways like we showed with our uh, day tracker or our daily time reports, or even the way we can take a, sh a shooting schedule from Movie Magic and create call sheets and daily production reports out of there. We don't want anybody having to start from scratch. And as we said, they've been doing that for over a hundred years. So they're, they're overdue for modular applications that aren't monolithic as we've been you know uh, drowning in and there's a lot of opportunity and certainly these panels and what's ahead will only drive that you know there's a, a, a lot of as you said earlier george it's it's all about the stickiness and where the rubber meets the road and i certainly our first pass at this was a massive failure because we just built a really sexy app that made the call sheet look nice and all of this look nice and there was no where uh, crew can actually use it and start integrating to their workflows. And as soon as we started connecting to Gmail and Movie Magic and all these other tools are using every day, uh, you know, we took off. You know, you bring you bring up uh, something you brought up initially because you, you started with the 1880s. <laughs> and like there is the, the, the true pain point here really is that there's so much waste of both of time as a resource, but all just general resources in this process because there's a lot of antiquated connective parts so the, the the quicker you can solve those problems or connect things faster the more people are going to get through the creative to the creative stuff in a timely manner and actually execute the things they want to do it's going to enable because the pain point is like is paperwork or like slowdowns or like messaging and like so these tools speed up the process and make it more effective in theory. And I think if, if that, that that's going to make sets at any level or production at any level better. Well, I think it's, it's the building blocks. I mean, at the end of the day, I think a lot of the challenge is also we know the production day is extremely long. And if you're lucky, it ends in 12 hours. But most of the time, it's about 14 to 16 hours. So no matter how fast your app is going, your director might want to take 27 takes at the end of the day. So those things are always things that we are beholden to, but this is the beginning of getting into further operations and logistics so that with a shot lister and all these other uh, products out there to start making uh, scheduling and the planning a lot more efficient so that we can start cutting on those hours. Because as I said, the crew is overdue for this efficiency. And the fact that I can know that Tom Holland should be in a movie in March and sold in like Eastern Europe but I still can't figure out how the crew can have a life is uh, it's completely wrong. Yeah, that that's a great point. And Shotlister, I love that it can, it, it's, it's uh, so you're solving a problem for the director who may be anxious about getting everything he or she needs, but you're also solving a problem for a crew that wants to get home and live a life, right? Like, so these things all feed into everybody's workflow, really. I think one of the other interesting things that happened with Shotlister that it's probably true of some of these other apps as well is, I think there was a there's a old um, culture of sort of secrecy on sets to some degree, especially amongst directors, like protecting their shot list and not making sure no one knows it so that they don't get in trouble if they don't get it all or something like that. I'm not quite sure where it comes from, but this sort of idea of protecting information so that your, your head doesn't get chopped off, I guess. Whereas if you embrace transparency of information, um, share the information as widely and as early as possible. You know, with Shotlister, the, the makeup trailer can be three miles from set and have a live look of how, of, oh, we're actually a little bit behind from where we thought we would be. You know, maybe I won't put on, I'll check to see if I should put that prosthetic on yet or whatever the case may be. So, um, and we found like producers who, in my experience, like when producers would normally be on your neck, like in that last hour of the day, like freaking out, they aren't because they know that, you know, producers usually their biggest concern is that they want to make sure that you know that you're in trouble. <laughs> and <laughs> by being able to show them like, I know we're in trouble and this is the plan, then they just relax. They don't, they don't need to know, they don't need to have you do their plan. They just need to know that you have a plan. Um, and, and that's true of the whole crew having, 
you know, we, on, on the shows that I direct, we send the shot list out to the entire crew with the distro the night before with a description of like, we're gonna start here. It's gonna be a tough day. We're gonna have to crunch to make sure we get this before the sun goes down and we're gonna do this. And, and everyone in the crew has that shot list timed out. And it just solves so many problems that we don't even know our problems because people go, oh, they're gonna need the crane built an hour before I thought I was gonna be called and just things just solve themselves with, with transparency of information. So I think all of these tools are, are ways of, of communicating more broadly and changing that culture. There's so much to that idea of transparency and sharing, which it seems like a lot of our, our guests also appreciate, but that uh, with, so with shot deck, for example, transparency of everything that goes into creating one of these shots instead of hiding it, but actually using it to try and inspire people or set them off in a direction. Um, and I, for my first few times on sets with budgets, the line producers I worked with weren't going to even show me how they built them. Like they didn't want anybody to know it was those were their keys to the kingdom those were not for me to use um and i think about scriptation like that transparency of notes like knowing what other teams are looking at or being given in terms of these are the notes they're going to follow this is the this is the floor plan that they're going to look at and these are the director's notes it makes everybody on the team feel like they're a part of the same team pulling in the same direction and not like they're being limited because they're less than or or not a part of that process. Yeah, and hopefully the insane demand on crew today with all the productions makes that tribal knowledge less anxiety ridden that like you can get another job, you're not gonna give away everything and never be hired again, because it's just insane right now. There are so many productions and that job security isn't as uh, you know acute as it used to be, I guess. There is a question here that I find sort of interesting that came in. Um, do you think the use of these apps on union shows is limited because the perception of apps and higher tier shows are reluctant to change or to make sense that low budget non-union shows adapt faster and then kind of give you more of an indie perception? And that's, you know, from No Film School's perspective, always an interesting thing because, there, you know, No Film School's audience is, is large and it includes people who've been working for years and people who are just starting. But this idea of DIY or new solutions always comes with a, 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 um, a connotation of low budget indie, not necessarily that people at the top are also looking to solve problems, which they are, by the way. <laughs> so like, it's it's sort of a misconception that like, just because something is a solution to a problem, oh, it's it's bigger, so we'll do it the old way. You know, we'll do it the, the slow way. It's not necessarily the case. Everybody's looking for efficiency and solutions. But do you guys have thoughts on that? I'll also say we're at this panel to meet more non-union shows because I would say 99% of the productions we've been on have been all union. So most of our productions, over 400 productions last year, over 99% union. I mean, it's really where we've been in. So we are hoping to go further downstream, but we have seen a lot of adoption uh, and a lot more openness. Like all the studios, as much as they give everybody a production binder, uh, there are also vendors that they have a list of. And if you inquire with the studio, they will tell you people as Steve and I have uh, shared a lot of horror stories about, but we, we are approved and they are opening that up and they're a sourcing team. So certainly it isn't, the studios are more open to it and uh, a lot more is happening. We're seeing a lot of change there for sure. Yeah. I would okay. assume that's true for a lot of you guys. I would assume it's, 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 it's an, it's a, not a, it's a misconception that that's the way things usually go, but I'm curious to hear from each of you as well. There was a movement over the, I don't know if you guys felt this, but there was a movement over the past, two years, let's say, to get a lot of apps approved that weren't previously approved. Um, Scriptation is in a weird position here because it's an app, you know, Shotless is the same way, you can just download it and start using it. So what approval do you really need for that? <laughs> You're gonna tell people not to use Gmail or something, you know? Um, but but I think for, for us, it's been kind of weird because we had pushback at the top on the studio level Yet when we were adopted by a show or a feature, it was the biggest show on television. <laughs> so be, because it's the people on that show had the power to say, we're using this. And then they go to the studio and say, OK, we got to get this thing going. So script, for Scriptation, it, it, it's been sort of a strange journey where we've you know given 
you know, it go, you start and you're giving it to everyone on the crew and then it sort of works its way up. And we don't have like, you know, our, our, I would say like our studio or enterprise clients are not the mid shows. It's the, it's the really high level shows that everyone's heard of that has the clout to say, we want to use this piece of software. And the studio is like, sure, whatever you guys want to do. Yeah, we've had the same experience. I mean, I think earlier, 13 years ago, it was definitely mostly the smaller shows, I think, because, but that, I don't think that was because of a studio issue. It was more because of the filmmakers at the beginning of their careers were more eager to look for tools because they were still forming their habits. Whereas all the directors at the DGA sort of had their habits <laughs> and they were happy with them and they weren't looking for a, to solve a problem. Whereas people at the beginning of their careers were looking to solve a problem, plus they needed to be more efficient because they didn't have as much crew and as much time. And then over the last 13 years, that's shifted a lot. We've, you know, a lot of those people have gone into bigger positions, but like Steve's saying, in the last two years, we've had top triple, you know, $100 million movies and massive TV series start adopting it because of auteurs basically just telling them I'm using this. And, and then, then we get a call from the studio security team um exactly. and we tell them a, a call it is what it is through support. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah uh, it, this know. is this is like every month where we get the same thing over and over again where it's someone is saying oh i want to use this and then you go through these approvals and you, it's like you're starting over every single time i think there's a certain bracket that's aging out that didn't want to change and had because they had a system that worked perfectly fine for them and the think about, newer bracket of people that are more just grew up with devices. Uh, and think about the people who are, who are young now. Think about the ones who are much, much younger than any of us and not working. And they're even more clued into what devices are going to work for them and what apps and software. And they're going to be the ones. They're going to adopt these tools, which is why everyone should start messing around with them to learn about them. Because all these tools we've talked about today are going to become more and more important. Because more and more of the people who are already in there, the gatekeepers are going to become reliant upon them or have expectations. And as that just shifts upwards, you're going to need to be versed in those tools. So, yeah, it's a smart move for anybody aspirationally to start testing them out and knowing how they work. Yeah, for the other question from the writer duet perspective, it's writing software, which makes it so much easier. And I feel not bad for you guys that you have to deal with all this, but I mostly don't have to think about any of this stuff because writers are typically writing stuff well before anyone is paying them, uh, even a lot of professionals. <laughs> Sadly. Uh, and so they're making the decision on their own. Uh, and, you know, even if they bought a pitch, no one's asking, and what software are you writing your, your first uh, script in? Uh, so it tends to only matter the writing software for like TV shows, maybe after they're going. And then it's honestly just decide like you know, said is by the showrunner and if the showrunner is already you know happy with it or, or they're using it it's going to be a tough sell to tell them not to write in the software they want and probably no one's even going to ask because it doesn't come and, up very often and Sh shot deck occupies a similar space where it's going to be for a lot of people creatively in prep but when it comes to collaborating if you want to make new collaborators and you want to know what they're doing and you want to look at the things they've done and you want to add to it or annotate it, that's where things like knowing how to use those tools becomes important as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but the interesting, the biggest barrier to entry that I think on some of these apps, and it doesn't, it's a little, it's it's marginal on our on our service, but a little bit more with Kruglu and scriptation, you know, is the security issues. Because if as the projects get more high profile, like then the script becomes red, it can't even be photocopied. So like the fear of God of this script getting out is probably to me like the biggest barrier, but you guys clearly have had to get over that hump because to me, that would be the biggest thing. If I was like a director and I'm like, hey, I wanna use uh, scriptation or I wanna like transfer all this stuff, it'd be like, okay, go, you know, jump over this massive wall to get through the security barriers. but. Got you know good on you guys for for getting through that. I'm sure the first big one one to get through was a was a huge curve, and we have that with sometimes like because we don't share a bunch in there, but we have ability to share. But we've had some of our enterprise clients, which are studio clients, ask about like well, because you, really what you're doing is you're building an inspirational deck. But if that inspirational deck, let's say, is for Black Adam, they still don't want that shared until Black Adam comes out, right? Right. And so I was gonna say. Those, 
some of those issues, yeah, for when sure. You start working on the board for Joker 2, not that it's been... <laughs> Trust me, it's, That's a when... folder, it's a folder already, and I'm sure, like, Warners doesn't want that folder to get out, right? So... Yeah, don't screen share that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, with, so I would say with Gad and, and Kruglo, he probably has the toughest go at it, and God bless him for getting it approved. Gad, I'm sure you can you can speak to this and how difficult. Yeah, the I mean, let's. For you. Yeah. Steve, you can see the attendees. I can. How many studio people are here? So I know whether I can see them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Well, it's going to show a hand. Live on YouTube, the chat. So they've got their spies everywhere. Uh, I mean, but let's be honest. You know, it, it, it's on a lot of things we hit on, and and how we're sitting here today. Things are changing at a quick pace, Netflix redefined everything, the studio system is over, and there is a new world order. I think everything is changing, and honestly, I think you can speak to this as well, being on like a super tier sh one show is the worst. You're gonna, be <laughs> they're gonna make you feel guilty for being on a big show. They'll spend months and months putting you through five different prostate exams. So really the opportunity, like it is with every other industry, it's about product-led growth. That's what we all are, as we touched on a few times. It's, it's at that user level. The people in the trenches are going to push this up. And we see this in every industry. Uh, and, and we see Netflix make an example of the studios this way. And it's no surprise that Netflix is also creating software. They've ne never used Synchronize. You know, and they said right away, we're not a content company. We're a data company. So you know, the opportunity is massive here. And I think studios are waking up to it because their output is so monstrous now that they might have to say, you know what, if you do have some money left, we'll take it. Whereas now there are no incentives for production managers to come in under budget. And if they call and say they have money left, they have to go spend it. So all of that has to change. And obviously we'll come from the bottom up and uh, you know, all of it's gonna change. I mean, globally, we see how content is and all these new production companies coming to the fore, everything's changing. I mean, it really is changing and I think Gone are the days of these five or six places that get to dictate everything that happens. So, you know, we have a really exciting wave that's coming through here and uh, we're all going to benefit from it. Absolutely. We have, yeah, you make a great point. We've been talking about movies and television. Content in a larger umbrella is so massive and all these tools apply. Uh, whether it's corporate videos or commercials or music videos or I don't know, TikToks. Like there's literally no, like the massiveness, and we know this in no film school too, like it's expanding at a crazy rate. So yes, we're talking about some of that, like kind of the the, the fun stuff, the, t the upper tier stuff, you know, that actually can be not fun as, as you mentioned, but like that, there, there are so many ways people take advantage of these tools, not Absolutely. just on those movies and shows. And I do wonder, I ask everybody here, have you been getting, as George just hit on, because I know in the last few months, I am getting a lot more solicitation from that spectrum. Uh, not to say we're still in, you know, our wheelhouse, but it, it has been amazing over these last few months, seeing this new, you know, content creation and how massive that ocean is and how many people are in it and that everybody's a content creator today. Anybody, are you guys getting more, you know, are yeah, you seeing I mean I know, like, it, I, I thought early on, you know, when building it, that it was going to be a little bit more of the entrenched sort of filmmakers that were pitching and all that. But our what we've discovered is, one, we have a lot of people that are just DIY that wouldn't even fit into the, uh, the sort of spectrum, but are making stuff and using the site like crazy uh, and ways in which, like, some of the users are surprising in, in terms of where they come from. Because in a way, like like we've all talked about, some of the entrenched filmmakers, they're just not building decks. They're not even <laughs> like they have people under people under people doing that for them. And those are the people using shot deck, whereas they're not like, <laughs> they're not trying to solve those problems anymore because they're like, all right, you know, I got people for this. Uh, whereas the people that are trying to get those jobs and the, they're the ones who really are, are using it like crazy. Yeah, I think same for us. I would say we, we do have a I would say the biggest single group is probably L.A filmmakers and stuff but they are tiny compared to the amount of people around the world right. and you know and and people that are doing wedding videos in Istanbul and doing corporate videos exactly. in, in Germany and doing you know uh, you know because especially our app is really helpful for people who have a small crew maybe not even have an AD they kind of got a few people in one on their iPad 
Um, and that's actually one of the most rewarding parts is getting emails from some province in China being like, we love, this was so great on our short film, you know, kind of, and that when you add up all those people, it's way more than sort of even just the Hollywood shows, if you will. Um, well, these tools all democratize the process, yeah. right? And they make it global. Like, like you can write your script with anybody anywhere. You can share your deck with anybody anywhere instantly. You can hire like, so I think that's the other thing that they, they, oh, they help open that gate and widen that corral, you know? Well, one of Scriptation's yeah. big projects over the next couple of months is to localize um, because we've just seen from our data that, you know, Scriptation is used all over the world now in countries that don't speak English. And we said, well, it'd probably be a good idea to, you know, do it, do have scriptation in their native language. So that that's a big project for us. But, you know, being able to have a website, being able to put an app out in the app store that goes everywhere, this is, you know, not something that's really been done. So you can, you know, just put your product out there and see where it gets adoption, see what users are coming and I think, I think this is, you know, a lot of our development is guided by, this is probably true for a lot of you, but it's guided by user feedback. So we have this one idea um, for the app and for, and, and then, okay, this segment is using it and these people are using it and okay, maybe let's build features for them or let's, you know, do uh, an added feature for this uh, department and it, that, it is totally democratized. And as um, founders of companies, we're we're listening to all the feedback we get because we want to serve you know certain communities and factions that use the app. Very interesting. You can see even with countries where they have infrastructure that is in some ways very modern versus the United States because they didn't have all those decades of building infrastructure that we did. And so internationally, in a lot of ways, same thing with screenwriting software as an example. Well, if they haven't been tied to Final Draft for you know 20 years, they can just pick whatever they think is genuinely best and they don't have to argue about, well, everyone else uses it. Well, everyone else uses nothing um, in some cases or Word or whatever in a lot of countries around the world. And so there's a lot of advantages for those people, I think picking the right technology. And the nice thing is people in America can do that too. And they, they are doing that and they should do it, but we can sort of take the approach of, we just trust people to make good decisions and find the best thing in their process. If they aren't using anything yet, it's even easier for them to make, make that decision out of the gate. We have, uh, we've been, all, we could keep going, I think for a while <laughs> and we have, but I do kind of want to wrap it up a little bit and maybe go around one more time. There's, there's a question that I feel like is a good one to end on in a way, which is it's, uh, since I've been using shot deck since beta, I've evangelized its use to everyone I can. However, as a 20 year old non-union member, do you think our generation will eventually be accepted with our use of efficiency multipliers? I, I kind of want to go around and, and everybody kind of talk on that for a second and, and do a, you know, a farewell and, and, and throw out again, any information you want about, about your tool. Yeah. I, I, I think this idea of, hold on a minute. I think this idea, I'm constantly looking towards the people way younger than me for those things, whether it was like, remember that Zach King guy who was like YouTube creating these incredible, like VFX videos, that guy became like my hero. I'm like, that guy should be the VFX supervisor on some huge movie, like not the other way around. Like, He's mm -hmm. figuring it out in an incredible way, but not just ways that are impressive, but just ways that are are innovative and fun, right? And so to me, I have to constantly, even though like, you know, my team is like, let's get on Discord. I'm like, not another one. But it's like, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm that guy because I'm still 52 and, and I'm still, you know, that curmudgeon. But like, I that doesn't mean I just go, I'm an old guy can, you know, but I, I don't dismiss them. I go, that's amazing. Let's do it. So I'm like constantly going, I want to understand what what people that are trying to, you know, like the, what I was 25 years ago, like scrapping and all the stuff that I have to remind myself to do that again. I'm like, love all those things. So to me, follow their lead rather than the other way around. Like they shouldn't copy our old you know archaic methods like that's the worst right like when you're in a meeting and you see that sort of attitude of like well that's not how it's done 
that's the worst. Like that always bums me out because you're like, no, let's figure out a better way. There's always ways to make things more efficient. You know, I've got a folder of little like, you know, moleskin journal of all the kind of shit I want to build. You know, I want to like find out how to get a gift for my wife. I want a better app for that. You know what I mean? So, like, <laughs> That'll be I'm in the next like, round table. This is a problem. Let's solve it. You know what I mean? Who's going to build that app? I want that. I want to build it. Anyone want to come in with me? I got a good idea for it. Honey, honey, uh, it's not my fault. The app said you would love it. It's not my <laughs> fault. <laughs> exactly. Zach, let's hop over to you then. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that it, it comes from whoever is passionate and, and, you know, no one's ever going to say, no, you, if you have an app that it's just a way of finding a way to fit it into the system you're in, some sets are going to be more accepting than others. Some cultures are more um, open to change than others. It usually comes from the top down. So if there's someone at the top that's, um, that's looking for innovation, like Lawrence, uh, you know, then, then that's your opportunity to, to kind of spread it. But my, my basic experience is if you're at, if you're 20 years old and you're just starting at the industry, like you and all your peers are going to grow up and become the industry. And so it might not happen. All the, all the changes and all the things that you, you're excited about may not happen tomorrow. They may, you know, it might be a case where you, you have that opportunity, but it will eventually for sure happen because it, um, you know, that's the, that's just how the world works. And if it doesn't build an app and make it happen. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, let's go over to Steve. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I started this app when I was super young <laughs> um, because uh, of an idea I had and now I'm old. <laughs> um, but so, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of an example of uh, trying to create something that is is uh, changing the way we do stuff. And we all like probably had the pain point. I mean, when I, when I was on that pilot, um, every, I, I, had, I was working with a showrunner that was a constant rewriter. And we had two weeks between the table draft and when we were shooting, it was a, it was a multicam, and the showrunner was putting out a it was one once we put out the script twice a fifty page script in the morning and then at night unlock script, so everyone is was feeling this like oh my god I can't believe we're doing this, um, and you know I I was someone that was like okay well maybe we can do something about it and I talked to everybody else. And I said, uh, if there was, uh, would you go digital? And for a range of, you know, 20 to 70. And there was like, you know, maybe I would, I don't know. And it's like, well, what if we could transfer your notes? Okay, sure. I will learn whatever I have to do to, you know, you tell me if you could, if you do that, I will, you know, buy your app. So um, I think for someone who's starting out in the business, there are so many the barriers to entry for even starting out the business are, are incredibly low and the barriers to entry for all of the software that we're putting out there are incredibly low. Um, and you could experiment and find the best tools that work for you, um, whatever it is, maybe it's, you know, seven different tools that you're using because that's going to make you the most efficient filmmaker so all of the things are there and i think as you know what zach said and if it's not and you want to find a better way to do something build it yeah uh gad you want to hop in on this topic sure um i'll quote a very good singer i believe the children are our future so <laughs> you know we're going to teach them well and they're going to lead the way right? <laughs> yes Stop. But no, seriously, <laughs> if we look at every other industry, this is inevitable. I think we touched on it a few times. You know, productions will be working out of some platform or dashboard where they can connect to all their crews and it's going to be some app marketplace or something like that where everything will just centralize and be a true ERP system. And we're, we're moving in that direction for sure. And we see a lot of work from movie labs and all these other organizations that are trying to standardize things, you know, so we do have a lot of standardization to work for. I mean, the uh, a shooting schedule, the script, the shot list, a day at a day, all these documents, even if I'm not using 
EP or any other software, they, they haven't really standardized to a point where unlocking all that data and moving things along will be a lot easier. So uh, I certainly think, you know, we don't have these conversations without that young generation already pushing forward and adopting all these tools uh, that brought us together. So again, I believe the children are our future. And some certainly stuff, are some stuff's gonna some stuff comes out of necessity like covid created circumstances in which you actually had to direct and shoot stuff remotely which was like unheard of except hitchcock would have loved it right like he would have embraced that technology if it existed in his day he'd, he'd be sitting at home directing the birds for sure right and so it's like that brought on a bunch of i think the fact that we now all use Zoom and we didn't even use Skype, right? So like those kind of things will be brought on and then suddenly technology becomes a necessity, not just like this efficiency thing. It, and, and I think these tools are an example of that as well, so. For sure. Uh, Guy, you wanna, you wanna take yeah. us home here? Sure, my thing about efficiency is it's not about efficiency for efficiency's sake, it's efficiency to create better art and to do better work. And that's why you're going to be not accepted, but demanded. They were like, well, that person makes all this amazing content and people are going to want that, like whatever skill you have, if you're multiplying, you're getting better. It's not just that you get better content in the moment. It's that you can iterate so much faster. You can make three short films because you're using these great tools to help you make it, or you can make, you know, whatever shots that you're trying to demonstrate how wonderful your art is. And you can keep trying and trying and trying while other people um, might take days to make something that you can do in hours. And I think that will be the thing that differentiates, let's call it the next generation, is they make better content because they learned from all the cool things and brilliant things that people foundationally did. Then they could iterate and test faster and faster with the modern technology. And even like, just as an example, they can see the flaws in it, reach out to the companies. I'm sure everyone here would love to hear from anyone in the audience who just has an idea or a thing they want, how to make that person's life better so they can create better art. We'll probably try to do that and make it better for you. And then you will again have another multiplier so you can make better quality work. That's all we want. That's what we all want you to do. Uh, yeah, it, it, the expansion of the capacity for more people to create different, better things that it's unique to them, it enriches all of us because we get to watch it or see it or experience it or be inspired by it. That for me is the motivator. I want to thank all of our panelists for doing this, for having me just to help talk. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for attending and so many great questions and comments. I haven't had time to answer read, but some really kind words have been said, and we all appreciate that. Um, this recording will be available. Um, we'll probably get something up on it on nofilmschool.com and we'll probably get it on the podcast, uh, the no film school podcast. You can find that and y links in the chat to everybody's site. So you can check it out and use these tools and explore them more and keep creating and and thank you all again so much for doing this thanks george for running this uh, i love no film school so i appreciate you, you thanks larry thank you yeah I'm, I'm just happy to be here <laughs> be a part of it thank you guys thank you. talk thank to you, you soon thank you all the best